Um, we are joined today by um, Luke and Shannon. Uh, as I've explained this to you before, uh, Luke is a partner at the firm Floyd Zakovich LLP and Shannon is a trainee and uh, formerly a student at um, Bridgewater and Taunton College. Floyd Zadkiewicz, International Commercial Lawyers. So, uh, I suppose uh, without any further ado, um, Luke, if you could just, we're very, you know, very fortunate and very happy to, you know, for your firm to be helping us and, and helping the students. Um, we'd be very interested to know, know more about, about your, your career. Well, thank you very much, Alex, um, for, for organising this and to Gemma as well. Um, and we are delighted that so many of the students are on, um, on this call. Thank you. Uh, I know it's, it must be a, a, a different kind of video conference to be having at this time. Um, but uh, we, we've got Shannon uh, Trout, as Alex mentioned, on as well, one of our trainee solicitors who um, uh, was a, a, a grad from your college. So I think she'll have some interesting insights to share with you. Um, and so really looking forward to what Shannon's got to say. But uh, yeah, as Alex mentioned, my name's Luke, um, Luke Zadkovich. I'm one of the founding partners of our law firm. Um, and uh, I thought it might be interesting for you to just have a little bit of a background on me. Um, so you, you kind of uh, know where I'm coming from and a bit about my story where the way we're going to structure this, um, this talk is that I'll, I'll um, give an introduction or some background on myself um, and then I'll hand over to Shannon and Shannon will, uh, she'll do likewise and uh, talk about her story. And then following that, we're going to open open things up for for discussion um, and we really want to um, be here to answer your questions and the the driving factor for this whole uh, call was that when the um, this terrible uh, virus has kind of taken hold and we, we all know the, the the devastating effect it has had in many different ways um, most importantly from a health perspective but also consequentially from that economically, it really is a period of, of um, great uncertainty. And I think often sometimes uh, students, um, particularly at your level and also university students, can be quite worried about, um, about what's, what it means for them. What's this all about? You know, you've not lived through a recession. None of us have lived through a global pandemic. Um, and... Uh, I, I can imagine that it, it must be a period of time when you're wondering, how does this all, all affect me? Uh, so uh, it was with that in mind that we thought, well, why don't we try and get in touch with some schools, um, offer to answer questions, provide guidance, give a bit of um, uh, direction perhaps, share some insights on what we do, what, what being a lawyer is about, um, and also how, if, if it's a, a career you, that, that you might be interested in, how um, can you, you move into that type of career or what can you be doing at this stage to, to head in that direction or even just get to, to sample it. So that was the thinking behind, um, behind this session. Really pleased to see so many people on, on board. It, it's, that, that's, um, it's, it's great to see. Yeah, so uh, a bit about me. Um, you may have picked up I've got an Aussie accent. Uh, I grew up in Australia, quite a long way away from London, um, and did all my schooling and uh, grew up in Australia and left um, after I'd finished all my studies um, and I was a qualified solicitor and moved to London. But um, I actually come from a a place in Oz, um, pretty similar to where your college is. It was a place, it's a place called Wollongong. So if anyone knows Australia, it's south of Sydney, one of the big capital cities. Uh, and uh, about an hour and a half uh, down, it's a, a sleepy town. Well, technically it's a city, but it feels like a town uh, on the beach. So I was a very keen 
surfer and football player growing up. I used to have long blonde hair, none of this kind of college boy haircut stuff. Um, and uh, it was a great place to grow up, you know, really outdoors, uh, lifestyle, um, a lot of sport, really typical Australian uh, growing up in that sense, always outdoors, barefoot, you, you, you can, uh, you can um, paint the picture. Uh, and from about, I don't know, my teenage years through to 16 or so, it was really all sport for me. I, I did okay at school and my marks were, were fine, but I wasn't really locked in in the way um, that I, I later um, uh, became. And it was, for me, I was all, as I say, all, all about sport. But when I got to kind of college years here in, in England, which in Australia would, I'd say, uh, 11 and 12. So your first, second years of college there, uh, was it fifth and sixth form? That was when I started to get quite serious about, about my studies. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do in, say, my first year of college. I didn't know what a lawyer was. I had no, literally no idea, no law in my family. Um, my parents were teachers, but there was, in, even in my extended family, no law at all. I had, other than watching Law and Order, which is probably a TV show um, before most of your time. What is it? Suits these days. But um, at that time, it was Law and Order. And that was pretty much all I knew, which was primarily criminal law. And there's a whole heap of law other than uh, criminal law out there. Uh, we can tell you uh, as we go on a bit about what we do. Um, but at that stage, that's all I knew. Um, and uh, I started off wanting to be a journalist and had other different things and or I hadn't even thought about careers. But by the time I got to kind of um, the second year, so my last year of school, when it came around for uh, university admissions, that was when I started to really uh, think about what is it that I want to do at university. And I, I locked into law at that stage but I as I said I didn't really know what law was about and it would have been interesting at that time useful I think to have someone to talk to um, and to do some experiences and and see what it's about to know whether that's the direction I wanted to go as it turned out I I went on to university I went to the local state school primary school local state high school local um, university, all, all very good schools, like a, a, a good quality education, but um, I, I didn't go to selective schools, and I didn't go to private schools, uh, very proud of my, my public education. And um, most importantly, I think I, I got to meet and, and mix with a, a great cross section of society. And it really set me up for, for, for life in, in lots of different ways. Education was a big part of it. But um, that that well-rounded um, uh, education that I got has really uh, set me up. I, in in my job now, I'm dealing with people all over the world, different cultures, different um, influences, different approaches, and uh, that that background going to the local um, local schools I, I think was a real added advantage to me now. And I can remember back at that time thinking that there are so many challenges and barriers and um, you know, how, how could I ever get into that university or how could I ever go and work in a big Sydney law firm? Like that to me just seems such a distant concept. Um, I was fortunate in that I had parents who were very encouraging. Um, my, my parents so were both teachers. They, they encouraged me to think uh, worldly about things and um, dream big, pursue dreams and all of that. But still, you know, when, you, when you're there sitting at school on, by yourself, you're thinking, can I really do that? Is that, can, can I really dream um, to do whatever I want to do and go and fulfill it? And, and I think if, if my story is anything, um, then, then the answer is yes to that. Um, and I, I, as I said, 20 years ago, I think, of, so what is it? Yeah, 20 odd years ago now, when I started university, um, I had no idea the path I was going to end up going. I, I didn't know I was going to be an international lawyer or set up an international law firm. Um, we've, we've now got offices in four different locations in London, New York, 
Chicago, Houston, we've got a great team, small team, but a, a great team of people working with us. Um, and I, I honestly, I, I, at your age, where you're at now, I would have, it, that kind of idea would have just seemed so far off. I would have been, oh yeah, whatever. You know, that just, it, it, I wouldn't have thought it was possible. But you know what? It, it is. It, it, it is possible. And the, the most important thing that I think I can, I can encourage you is one, to, to dream big. Um, but also to work hard and that that's that's the most important the biggest takeaway from this talk if I can um, share any of my experience or my guidance is to work hard at whatever you're doing work hard um, whether it's your studies and at, at your stage your actual marks are going to be the most important it's the the uh, one step that I took that I um, am so glad I did so as I said I, I played lots of sport, all of that, right through until 16, 17, wanted to hang out with all the cool kids and, you know, this and that. Um, but when it got to those, those college years that you're in now, I really let a lot of it go. I, I kept up my exercise to stay sane and yeah, so I'd still go out on a Saturday night, and let my hair down with my mates, not during exams, but you know, during school year, uh, uh don't tell your parents I said that. Um, but uh yeah i i really focused on my studies for those two years i, I was single-minded um, put the blinkers on and just really tried to get the best marks i could and i said you know what i'm gonna leave everything on the table whatever i can get i get that's my best that's the best i can do i don't want to look back at the end of um school and say you know what i, I could have done a bit more on that or i could have done a bit more on this and those two years for me were, in terms of my studies, were the foundational years for the rest of my career. Now, I, I went on, as I said, to work hard and I've got to where I've got today um, through working hard, I think primarily, but I did really switch on um, and, and study for those periods of time where, where you are right now. Uh, so look, uh, I could probably just keep uh, talking and talking and talking, I won't. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Shannon to introduce herself, um, tell, her, uh, tell you a bit about her. Happy to um, answer any questions, follow up questions on you know, my background and get into some detail and share some stories. Um, I understand you've got some prepared questions as well, which is, which is great. So in your hands really, um, and I'll hand over to Shannon. Okay, hi everyone, thanks for that Luke. So to start really, I guess my legal career is even fresher and earlier than Luke's. Um, I have just finished one of my third um, qualifications and in September started my training at Floyd Zadkovich, which is really exciting and has been really brilliant. Um, I started in a very similar place, in fact, in the exact same place as you guys. I went to Chilton Trinity Technology School did my GCSEs there and then went to Bridgewater College uh, as my brothers and sisters did before me. Um, you know, I know what it was like growing up in Bridgewater. I've been there all my life. In fact, I, I love it there. I, I think that lots of people think that it's one of those places that isn't a big city. You know, it, it's not one of those places, but there's, there's loads of opportunities and I really enjoy being there, living there, growing up there. Um, I went on to Bridgewater College after finishing my GCSEs and I studied my law A-levels with Gemma and I think that was uh, about seven years ago now. I remember sitting in those classes crying, thinking it was something that I couldn't do, you know, it's a really intense course and it's really different to anything that you study at school. It's not maths, it's not science. It's a little bit Englishy, but law was something completely different and it was exciting, but it was hard. Mm. Um, but I did well. I was in the students union at your college. Um, I enjoyed that. That again is something that is really great for your extracurricular. I know that the college offers loads of things like that, like being an ambassador. Um, you have loads of sports at the college as well, which are really good things for your personal statements and then even for your CVs. So I put my experience on the students union at Bridgewater College on my CV to apply for my training contract. It was a long time before 
I, you know, it was something that came a lot longer before I was at uni, but it was something that was important to me and it was something that built me as a person and created my character and my ability to speak to other people. So if you think it's something that's silly because you're at college, it, it certainly isn't. It, it's something that, that helps you and if that helps you and it builds you as a person, then it's important. Um, after Bridgewater College, I went to Plymouth University which again isn't too far away from the college, uh, about an hour and a half in fact down the road and there I did my LLB which again was great, three years, um, nice and close to home which I found was really important and I think that's probably one of my biggest pieces of advice is that you know you and if you're someone that isn't confident about being away from home because it's one of the first times you're going to be away from home most people then there's no shame in going to a university that's closer to home that's not an Oxford or a London university. If you're more comfortable, you know, and you know that you're going to do better somewhere where you feel comfortable, there's no shame in that. There's no need to feel like, oh, I've been to Manchester to do my degree. There's, if you're going to go to Manchester to do your degree, but you're not going to be able to concentrate because you're stressed about how to boil pasta for dinner and things like that or you're stressed about not being near mum and dad, which is no shame, because I'm certainly like that even now, you know, there's no point. You might as well go somewhere that's close. So that's one of my biggest pieces of advice. Um, at university, again, I did very well, um, which like Luke said, your grades are important. The best thing you can do, you can do only your best. And I think that's one of the most important things as well, doing your best, not what other people are best at. You know, lots of people have their strengths and their weaknesses and being able to admit to your weaknesses is very important. Um, I did lots of society things there as well. Like Luke mentioned, you can do another thing at Bridgewater College. I know you can do debate club with Gemma. So that's another great way to, that, that's brilliant. I think I remember doing debate club and my friends doing debate club, a great thing for your CVs. Um, but back to uni, once I finished uni, I went to uni again <laughs> because I enjoyed it so much. It was by the end of my degree, actually, that I knew that it was something that I definitely wanted to do. So then I went on and did a master's degree at Southampton where I specialised in maritime law, which is quite niche maybe, um, not something that everyone gets to know about or not something that everyone does, but it was a topic that interested me and I think that's a really good thing as well, is like finding that one thing, fi finding, if you like property, good for you and you know, really focus on that and make sure that you've got your um, variety of knowledge on it and that you know it well and that will be really helpful for you. And then after my masters, I did the LPC. So that if you want to be a solicitor in the UK, in England and Wales, you would go on from normally straight from your degree to do your LPC. Um, that's a year long course. I did my master's and then my LPC, um, but you do that and then you go out into the big wide world and apply for those training contracts. Um, so that's what I've been doing. I'm now training at Floyd Zadkovich, been there since September. And yeah, it's really enjoyable. If it's something that you are really passionate about and really want to do it, then I would highly recommend taking the route that I've taken, um, whether that's going to a different university, going and doing two master's degrees afterwards or no master's degrees afterwards. It's a really um, fulfilling, even at a trainee level role. And I would highly recommend it um, if it's something that you're interested in. I'd be more than happy to help you with your personal statements because I remember that being really daunting and really terrifying. Um, what are these people going to think about me? Why they're not going to, you know, they're not going to judge you for anything. If anything, they're going to be excited for you being on the football team or doing that debate that you lost you did it. So that's great. You know, so um, yeah, really happy to help with anything university wise, really happy to take your questions on anything you'd like to ask. And I think on that note, I'll hand over back to Alex to take those questions from you guys. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Luke and Shannon. Um, so what we've got um, is we have a just over a dozen questions, which we may not have time to go through all of them. Uh, but we'll, we'll try our best. Um, uh, there are a mix of personal questions which might relate to what Luke and Shannon have said and some of them are, are more legal related. 
so okay that's that's a good question um maritime law is uh, it's a multi-layered area of law and it, it it can get quite complicated there there are regulators um involved but i i'm not sure the regulators are the are the main focus in maritime law maritime law uh relates to um pretty much the carriage of goods by sea. So we're all aware of um, uh, commodities that are being shipped by sea from, you know, ports all around the world, whether it's goods coming from, from China into England or, um, you know, uh, grain that's being um, harvested in the U S and shipped to parts of the world. All of that carriage of commodities by sea that that is the maritime that we're talking about here primarily um so the ships that are sailing and, and carrying the commodities that's the maritime element and maritime law relates to all the laws um that govern contracts and incidents and collisions and injuries and all of those kinds of things that happen in and around the carriage of goods by sea. So the, the laws um, uh, come from a few different sources. There are national laws. Um, so each country will have its own maritime law uh, where that law will, will set out um, what can and can't be done in certain respects. Um, and you will find maritime law in every country basically that has um that, that has some um, border to the sea you also have sitting above that international conventions uh where um nation states so governments get together and um seek to agree on what standards they will apply uniformly um uh, and internationally so in other words rather than having different maritime laws in the uk um, on certain issues than um, the the maritime law in the us uh, they seek to agree upon that at an international convention level and then um, with that convention agreed uh, they then uh, the governments then implement the international convention in their respective countries so when you're looking at the regulators or you're looking at the source of law the lawmakers in maritime law you're looking at the um the the nation or the the country in which this issue is arising the other really important part of maritime law to think about is that a lot of the issues that you see are contractual and I, what I mean by that is a lot of the arguments or the claims, commercial arguments that arise between the parties relate to a contract. So if, if um, Lisa, you, you are um, selling some product, you've got some grain that you want to sell to, uh, to me and I'm, I'm in Australia and uh, your grains they're uh, near the college what, what would be the closest place um to ship at plymouth uh, yeah maybe anyway plymouth okay so pl pl plymouth to let's say plymouth to sydney and um i say yes i want to buy your grain you say okay i'm going to charge you 100 pounds i say well that's a bit steep can we do it for 80 pounds and we settle on 90 pounds uh, we'll then put that into a contract and we'll say um i'm the buyer you're the seller uh and i will pay you 90 pounds um for uh, for your cargo and let's let's say for argument's sake that that includes the cost of um uh, delivering the goods to sydney that's a pretty good deal for a buyer um uh and um so then you, if we have agreed that you are responsible for delivering those 
goods to Sydney, you have to find a ship. You have to go and get a ship to carry the grain from Plymouth to Sydney. And the contract that you enter into with the ship owner, that's most likely going to be called a charter party, but that contract um, is a maritime law contract. The contract that you enter into to carry your goods from A to B. If something were to happen during the carriage of those goods, um, I don't know, the ship was late. Let's say with this exact issue we're dealing with at the moment, you've got a pandemic and the ship is delayed. There may be an argument between you and the ship owner as to who has to pay for those delays. If you and the ship owner cannot agree on how to deal with that issue, you have a dispute and you have um, a claim and you, you'll, you'll want to um, eventually, if you can't work it out by negotiation, you'll want to deal with that claim. Most maritime contracts have in them what's called a dispute resolution clause. So the parties to the contracts so that you and the ship owner have agreed in advance in your contract before anything has happened that if a dispute arises, we're going to deal with it in England. Could be in the courts, could be in arbitration. Uh, and so when that dispute arose, when the, there was a delay, you couldn't agree, you couldn't work it out, um, you have already agreed in advance that that dispute will be dealt with in England, in London, let's say in arbitration. Uh, and that's what the parties have agreed. So you would then be forced, you would have to deal with that claim in England to have it resolved and have a decision um, on the case. And then you, you find out who wins and loses on who's responsible for the delays. The reason I've, I've explained that whole um, story or scenario to you is because what I'm driving at is the way that those parties have decided to resolve that dispute was um, contractual. They agreed to do it. So um, that claim or that issue that then is being dealt with by the English courts or in arbitration, um, that has gone to that country because of party's choice. And so when you're looking at the regulators or sources of law, in a way, it's also in maritime, it's it's very important to, to remember that the parties are actually choosing not just where they want their disputes to be decided, but also the national law that will govern that dispute. So parties' choice is another big part of it. I think the short answer is the challenge of it. And then, um, uh, going out on, on our own and um, setting it up. It wasn't a, a decision that was made overnight. Um, it was a bit, a bit of an itch uh, that um, I, I had for quite a long time and just kept scratching and eventually I went ahead with it. Um, I, I think I was at a point in my life, so for everyone, everyone's understanding, our firm has been going for three years. Um, we set it up and we, we set it up first in New York. Uh, I um, co-founded it with my partner, Ed Floyd. So it's the Floyd in, in Floyd Zadkovich. Uh, and that's a bit, bit of a mouthful to, for a law firm anyway, to have Zadkovich in your name, but it seems to be doing all right so far. Um, anyway, so we set it up in New York and the idea was to bring together US law and English law in one small boutique um, and be able to do both areas. Or, and there's not really any other firms that are doing that. Um, they're either English firms or they're US firms. And so our kind of idea was to combine the two. Um, and I, before that, I had worked in big um, law firms. I worked at one of the major um, London shipping law firms. I also worked for it's called a P&I club, but it's like an insurance um, mutual for or an insurance company for um, for ship owners and, and trading companies. So I had some experience in big 
institutions and big companies and the same back in Australia as well. And I, I don't know, I just wanted to try and do my own thing, you know, a bit of the entrepreneur in me uh, and wanted to, to give it a crack. Um, and like a lot of what I've done over the years, I, I thought about the plan, um, let it settle, think it through, work out what's the best way to do it. And then Jessica, I, um, I kind of, yeah, laid out a, a, a plan a number of years in advance, really, um, to develop a, a network, uh, in an area, um, in a geographical area, which was the, the Americas to go with the other contacts that I'd already built up, um, such that I got to a point where I thought, you know what, um, I can do it. The business case is there and, you know, um, yeah, yeah th th those were kind of some of the, yeah. the factors. And also this, I've always liked the idea of working with teams and, um, creating your own team uh is a, is a great feeling it really is and yep. seeing people like shannon and the others others in the team all you know wanting to work for the the, the common cause that we've we've set up it's a really good feeling <laughs> that's a great question for me, I might personally. pass that one over to Shannon, see how she handles it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not trying to add to the second part of that, Brad. Um, I, and I am, I think, it's, I think it's important to note, you know, things that you don't always enjoy, but things that are teaching you and, and making you a better person, a better lawyer. Same at college, things that maybe you don't necessarily like, but are making you a, a better, per, like, student. Um, so I think something that I don't always enjoy is uh how fast paced it can be sometimes i think it's something that you need to expect being a lawyer and it's something that i'm learning so bearing in mind i've been in a studying situation the same as you guys until last september so that's something that you don't really experience when you're studying you know you have a six week deadline for work and so something I imagine that lots of trainees experience not just about working at Floyd Zadkovich is how fast paced things can be and that takes some getting used to but that's also one of the good things about the job and one of the fun things and um, I think that is also something that I do enjoy so it, it, it goes in both hands I think Luke probably confirmed that he felt the same way when he started hopefully <laughs> um, but I enjoy learning new things that's my main thing. Um, it's something that I've always enjoyed. From crying in A-level classes, it, it, it was still fun because I was learning something new. You know, doing those degrees, it was great learning something new, but not just learning something new academic-wise, learning something new about other people and getting to meet other people. And at Floyd Zadkovich, my network has just been opened up massively. And like Luke mentioned earlier, um, he took his time making his network and, and i've noticed that that's something really important um it's it's the fun part of the job really it, it, one of the fun parts because there's many of them but i i just enjoy meeting new people speaking to new people um something i've always enjoyed doing so yeah they they're my pros and cons of working at floyd zadkovich but i imagine that's how many people feel um at all law firms really yeah about you luke <laughs> yeah i think that's a that's a great answer um shannon i really do um the people for me uh, and, and this is not limited to law of course but um the interaction with people is what i um, without doubt enjoy the most about the job um so the people i work with the clients that we service and other other um colleagues out in the industry whether at competitive firms or um you know uh other other uh, firms around the world that we deal with i'm also um as you can probably have gathered having grown up in australia lived in london and new york i also like traveling um and i um i have always enjoyed that and seeing different cultures um sitting down and having a um i don't know uh, a tea in morocco or w whatever it is um some baklava in turkey uh and talking through um yeah w what's happening in the world and I i've I've really enjoyed that in, in tough times, like it, you know, now um, we've been reaching out to our contacts around the world and 
um, seeing how they're doing and how they're going. And um, oh, that's not something you enjoy, but having that international network, it's, um, I know I, I value that a lot. Day to day, um, I don't like time entry. I'm, I'm terrible terrible at time entry. Uh, that probably doesn't mean much to you, Brad, but we have to record every six minute unit of our life um, <laughs> at a law firm, uh, <laughs> particularly work that's billable for the clients because that's how we generate the invoices uh, uh, for clients. I really don't like doing it. It's a, it, it takes so much time, but it's absolutely essential. Otherwise, none of us get paid. So uh, we, we have to do that. I don't like that. Um, uh, I, other things I enjoy, um, I enjoy the intellectual rigor and the, the challenge. I, I, that's always been uh, a big part of the job for me um, in, in that uh, law throws up all sorts of problems um, or, or complications if you're on the project side and doing transactions. And if you like problem solving, if you like um, trying to work something out that's tricky um, and you might at this stage you might not necessarily put that in a in a legal context uh, and at, at, honestly when I was at school my best um, subject was maths um, it wasn't English and history I was um, I did all right at English and history but my the what got me into university was my maths and physics marks and actually some of the thinking that's involved in that um, where you're problem solving and you're you know, playing the games of chess, so to speak, that comes out into law a lot. We're, we're constantly strategizing and tactics and um, thinking about different, um, you know, different things we can do and trying to work out problems. I really enjoy that. That's, um, that's a big part of the job uh, that I enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, so Im important question. Um, from from our perspective, in terms of Floyd Zadkovich's perspective, um, we are very fortunate, to be honest, um, in that um, our business has been able to continue to work largely um, uninterrupted uh, by uh, COVID. We have had to change how we are set up operationally, um, and I can touch on that briefly in a moment, but compared to many, many businesses out there um, and, and workers and, and others, um, we're, we're quite fortunate, to be honest. Um, and yeah, we're so in a way, um, it's, it's more our clients and those that we are working for that have been affected um, and drastically affected. And so the types of companies that we work for um, uh, commercial companies primarily. We work for some individuals as well, um, but it's primarily international businesses and they have been affected in many, many ways by the, um, by the economy being shut down. Um, a lot of them have not been able to ship their goods. They've watched the demand for their goods dry up overnight. There have been quarantine periods imposed in a number of countries where if a ship turns up to the coast, let's say in Italy, which was one of the early uh, heavily affected countries, um, ships had to wait there for you know days and days before they could um, discharge their cargo. All of those delays adds up to um, uh, economic consequences for the client. Uh, and so there's a, there's been a lot of um, complications for our clients, but operationally we were already um, working primarily. We have an off offices, of course, where we go to, but um, in providing our advice and working on our cases, most of that is done by email uh, or other online um, software. We can even file claims um at court electronically these days so if you want to commence a you know a 20 million dollar claim against someone that can all be done online believe it or not uh and that's the same in the us as it is in england and other parts in the world and um what's been new is that the courts have really embraced 
uh, online technology over the last two, three months uh, so that um, trials and hearings are being um, had over uh, conferencing systems just like this one and maybe not zoom but i think it, it was skype that we used for a like for business. trial yeah. yeah um and shannon you got to see that uh, that trial it was really interesting um so i think that was last monday and we had a trial via skype it was actually my first ever trial plus first ever virtual trial and it was interesting you know and it, it's quite cool to see the way that it's all adapted because of the coronavirus especially in terms of the trial, the way they're running trials, definitely. Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. Oh, wow. uh, that's the kind of question I might get from a client. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to put on my actual legal advice hat now. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, in a way, the, the differences, um, there are considerable differences and in other ways there are not um, so many differences. Um, firstly, uh, between England and UK and f some of you may have um, studied this a bit already, some may, may not, so um, uh, I'll, I'll try to cater for all. Uh, the, the two jurisdictions are common law jurisdictions. Okay, so if you've, if you've learned at all about civil law jurisdictions like in France and um, uh, other countries which are more code based, um, both the UK and the US are common law countries. So their, their origins at least um, are, are based in um, ju judgments and judge made, court made law. Um, of course, as the years have gone on, um, that has changed. And now parliament um, is, is very active and there's a lot of statutes in place in the UK and in the US. Um, but at, at, their, at their heart, they are still common law jurisdictions. And indeed, the US system is a derivative of the UK system just like Australia um, is as well, and some other common law um, countries that have had English influence over the years. And so the way that the US system is structured and the way it works largely follows uh, the UK. It is different um, in the sense that you have um, as a federation of states, the United States. So you, you have the 51 states and there's um, an important distinction between state law and federal law. And so the, the, the structures are different. Um, and because of those different states, the way that the appellant, um, so the appeal courts uh, are structured in the US, they've separated them into circuits so a number of states together will be in one circuit um, and, and and other states that are together will be in, in a different circuit so if you have an appeal um, in the us if it's um if it's a federal so there's you remember you've got this fundamental difference in the us between federal and state claims and they have different appellant procedures so if you have a federal claim, which is primarily what we would deal with as a maritime uh, on the maritime work, uh, which is a federal um, type of law, you're going to be in the federal courts, the, the, the district courts of the United States. And if you have a decision that um, has gone against you um, and you want to appeal that, you will be appealing to the relevant circuit for the the state in which that district court claim has been brought and dealt with uh, if you're in the state system in the us the appellant um, process works through um, state courts so you'll be in the, the state the, the state court and then you'll be appealing to the the supreme court of the state after so, so that's in the state context. In the federal context, above the circuits, above the, the appeals courts, 
Uh, you then have the Supreme Court of the US, which is the highest, um, the highest court. Uh, there are different rules about, you know, what, what you can appeal at certain levels. Um, typically, it's going to be um, on an error of law. So you're going to be arguing that the judge at first instance of the first court that dealt with that claim, they were wrong as a matter of law. Um, there are there may be procedural irregularities as well, but typically it's going to be an error of law. Uh, and so you're in the federal context, as I say, you're going to go district court to the appeals court. But then if you want to get into the Supreme Court of the US, you need to have a circuit split. Um, and what that means is on the issue that you've taken to um, the appeals court and you're not happy with the appeals court, you want to appeal it again, you have to find that issue dealt with by another circuit in the US differently. So there's a split across the circuits such that the Supreme Court gets interested in the case and they say, okay, as the, as the highest court in the land, we want to resolve this this split between the different circuits and then, and then they'll grant um, permission to deal with the, the case. In England, you don't have this, in, this important, um, as much anyway, you don't have this important distinction between states and federal law. Um, it's mainly gonna be English and Welsh law. And, but you do have similar um, appeal courts. So most of the uh, cases we deal with are in the commercial court. Um, and if we want to appeal that again, typically it's going to be on a point of law. So an error of law, uh, it will be to the court of appeal. And um, uh, again, to get from the court of appeal, if you're unhappy with it and you want to appeal to the English um, Supreme Court, uh, it uh, also requires um, that the issue is of um, great significance uh, in, in some way. It's, it's not exactly the same test as a circuit split as it is in the U US, but in the UK, you do still need to demonstrate that this issue is worthy of um, uh, a decision by the Supreme Court. That's not necessarily the amount of money that's at play, it's the significance of the, of the issue. And you'll see as you read more English judgments that sometimes there are cases being dealt with in the Supreme Court for 10,000 pounds. Like it, it, it's not, it, it, it's, as I say, not necessarily a, um, uh, the value of the, of the claim that's important. It can be the significance of the issue. Um, what, that's a good question. Um, maybe I should have got these questions sent through in advance. <laughs> um, no, uh, it, it's an interesting one. Um, the, the systems are quite similar in some ways, as I said before, and quite different in other ways. And I, sometimes uh, the main area where I would think um, that I'd like to see one jurisdiction do something and the other jurisdiction do something is on discrete points of law. Um, the, there are procedural differences and I'll touch on those in a moment. Um, but where I find myself and it's one of the, uh, the processes that I've really enjoyed about setting up the firm that we have is that, um, uh, my other co-founder, um, Ed Floyd, uh, he um, is a US lawyer, a New York attorney. Um, I'm primarily an English solicitor, although I'm also qualified as a New York attorney and I've been doing quite a bit of US work as well. Um, putting the Australian qualification to one side for a moment, but uh, for present discussions, um, I would be coming at it with, with an English perspective and he would be um, uh, coming to a discussion from a US perspective and on various areas of law or various issues that arise on any particular case, we find ourselves um, saying, well, actually England would deal with this in this way or the US would deal with this in that way. Um, and we have found having the different perspectives on a case have actually 
um, allowed us to be much more creative in resolving cases and coming up with new arguments. Like there's a, an example, a recent example um, that I could give you. It, I won't get into the detail of it because it is quite um, complex, but we had a, um, a journal article uh, published by Tulane Maritime Law Journal, which is one of the leading um, maritime law publications, uh, Tulane, uh, T-U-L-A-N-E. And they're the, the US equivalent of Southampton, if you like, and a very focused maritime um, course there. And they have a great journal. Anyway, we were fortunate enough to be published by them on I, I think a fascinating topic. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, everyone on here might find it as fascinating as me, but it was all about um, a ship owner's liens over cargo. And it is, a, it is, as I say, it's quite a nuanced area of law, so we'll not, I won't get into the ins and outs of it, but it was basically about how a ship owner can hold on to cargo to make sure they get paid. That's effectively what it breaks down to. Um, and if in, in England, if you're a ship owner and you agree, going back to the example, um, earlier, was it, was it, was it with Lisa? Was it Lisa was shipping grain anyway? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, going back to, to the example of, um, Lisa shipping grain from Plymouth to Sydney, the, the ship owner would say to Lisa in that situation, well, uh, you have to pay me um, whatever it is. So it was 90 pounds, the deal. So we'd say the shipping was 60 pounds or something, something less, maybe 60 pounds. The ship owner will say, you have to pay me that um, 60 pounds. Otherwise, you're not going to get your cargo. I'm going to hold on to that cargo until I am paid. That's in legal terms, what we call exercising a lien. In England, breaking it down, um, if you, at the, at the end of that trip, if that ship owner got to, um, to uh, Sydney and decided to discharge the cargo, so hand over the cargo without exercising its lien, so without holding on to it, keeping possession of it, it loses its rights um, as against the cargo. It's still got a claim against um, the, the party who hasn't paid them for the carriage, but they've lost their rights against the cargo. That's, the, that's what we talk about when we talk about liens. In the US, right, so that's the English position. If you let go of the cargo, you part with possession, you lose your rights against the cargo. In the US, it's um, a bit different where you can um, you can maintain your lien or maintain the rights against that cargo more easily, even if you part with possession. So that grain that got delivered in, in Sydney, the ship owner could still try and bring a claim and hold on to that cargo while it's ashore. And that's one just one discrete area. I, it's at the top of my mind because we, we spent about 50 pages trying to explain it in this article. Uh, we can send you a copy if you're interested. Um, uh, absolutely. But that's one area of law where I, I've been thinking, actually, I very much like the US approach. I don't like the English approach so much. And that's the recommendation that we made in that case. There are also um, other differences completely away from discrete areas of law, such as I think one of the obvious ones is um, there's a split bar in England and there's not a split bar in the US. And what I mean by that is we have barristers who once upon a time used to wear the horsehair wigs and the gowns and all of that. Um, they still do that on occasion, but not as regularly. Uh, so we have barristers uh, in England and we also have uh, solicitors who work up the files, they handle the clients, um, do all the preparation for court and, and all of that. Uh, whereas in the US, um, you do both. So you're, you're um, an attorney and the attorney is the one who deals with the clients. They're also the ones who appear in court. Um, and uh, look, I can see, honestly, I can see pros and cons in both of them. I wouldn't sit here and say I like one absolutely better than the other. 
Um, but there are there are pros and cons in both of those those systems. There is in the US approach, um, I think something to be said for the advocate um, having a, a close connection with their client. Um, although on the US, on the English side, I can also see the case for barristers just having a very narrow focus on advocacy as a skill set and, and only doing that. But it's changing, times are changing and, and the, the role of a barrister is changing, the role of a solicitor is changing. So we'll see. Anyway, I hope, hope that's answered your question. So, so, so everyone knows, uh, just to frame the question a bit, um, magic circle firms are the top, I don't know, let's say top 10, maybe it's six or seven or eight, but uh, top 10 law firms um, by size, scale uh, in, in England, uh, Freshfield, Allen, Overy, those types of firms, Slaughter and May. Uh, and um, they tend to pick up the, the, the largest transactions with most money at play um, and, and also some of the, the major disputes. Uh, and they have um, teams that are structured uh, in a way to deal with some of the, the, the biggest cases that there are. Um, that said, um, there are a lot of boutique uh, law firms um, or mid-sized law firms that um, deal with um, major transactions and major um, litigation. We are, in terms of the big ticket stuff, we are more on the litigation side than the transaction side. Um, and we do handle many transactions, um, but the, the big M&A work is really handled by the, the Magic Circle and, and the bigger firms. But on the on the litigation side, um, the the boutique firms do um, just as much, arguably, as uh, as the the magic circle on on that um, large scale work. Uh, how I, I'm not sure it would be different. It's more a question of wh whether the work is um, retained in the first place. But once once the work is um, brought in the door, and let's say, as we do, work on some very large pieces of litigation, then I'm not sure uh, there is all that much difference between Magic Circle and, and the rest. It will depend on who you ask. Uh, but in my view, um, I think the way that those firms are structured is more institutional. So they're looking at um, an, an integrated institutional approach to client relationships. Um, whereas boutique firms will have, and, and they're also highly leveraged. So associates and junior staff will be working on the cases and that's how they make their money by leveraging their associates. In the boutique firms, the smaller firms, the partners are going to be much more involved typically. Um, and this is broad generalization, of course. Uh, are going to be more hands-on and involved in handling that issue in that case. So you could say that um, in the smaller firms, you, you might get more attention. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure one way or the other that the actual way that the claims are dealt with is going to be all that much different, to be honest. Um. To be completely honest, I thought the transition from GCSE to A-level is a lot harder. Um, you're expected to go really in-depth in something in your A-levels that you don't necessarily do in your GCSEs. Um, I found my LLB really interesting and the format made it, a, the jump didn't feel that big. It didn't feel like I was going into something that I totally had no idea what was going on. You also have your like basic legal background from your A-levels that helps on your LLB. Um, I certainly couldn't say the same about the jump from LLB to masters because that again was something super specific. So that jump felt very big, um, but I was prepared for it. And I think that's the most important thing is that you shouldn't be worried that you won't be able to handle it because you definitely will. And universities have that support system that if you feel like you're not quite getting hold of it they will help you you're not left on your own 
you know, um, my university was brilliant with things like that. So to answer your question, I think that the jump is probably bigger from GCSEs to A levels and you'd be totally fine um, going on to the LLB if that's something that you wanted to do. Um, okay, um, top three qualities. I think the academics uh, um, are important. Um, there's no getting around that, that um, hard work and demonstrating that through academics um, uh, is, a, is a key factor. Um, the person themselves, how they, they come across, um, how they interact, how they speak, um, you know, whether they're engaging, whether they're interested. Um, we, a, a big part of our, in our firm, what we look for is a good fit. I know that sounds like a bit of a cliche, um, but it is present company accepted. No, Shannon, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks very much, Luke. Uh, <laughs> but no, you can, you can get a feel for, you know, just speaking to Shannon, um, you know, that it's important for, for our firm that we have personable people and people who um, are engaging and, um, uh, yeah, willing to um, uh, speak up and uh, confident and all of that. And then the other one, and this is what I wanted to touch on, I might as well do so now, is, is really about commitment um, and hard work and dedication. Uh, and that, that's going to take you a long way no matter what career you want to do, whether it's in law or, or anything else. Working hard is really going to be, in my view, the defining factor as to how far you go. Um, it's what's got me to where I am today. In every role I've had, I've worked hard. Uh, I first worked hard for my grades in, in um, you know, the college years that you're in. And then um, when I went to university, my marks were still good, but I, I started working as a paralegal from the first year and worked throughout all my LLB. In Australia, you actually do an LLB with another degree. So I did politics and, um, and law and uh, worked for, so studied for five years. Um, and I worked for the vast majority of that. And, and the work that I did as a paralegal, I then used that as a springboard to get my first job as a um, qualified solicitor after finishing my studies. Um, but as I say, the, the key in that was really to work hard. And the way that you demonstrate that um, in an application process is by showing commitment to other things. Uh, so studies, good marks, number one definitely, but getting involved in other things, extracurricular activities, whether it's um, associations, journal, writing, um, something outside of school, so sporting or hobby or, or what, what, whatever it is, or working. You know, a lot of us have to work. Um, let's make no mistake about that. I had to work to <laughs> get enough money to get myself through my studies. I didn't have any money given to me by my parents, um, so I had to work. And so, I, I looked at my practically through university as well. I need to earn money. I might as well be a paralegal and earn money in a, in the field in which I'm um, interested in. And then I'm going to learn about what a lawyer is like and the rest of it. So, but it, coming back to your point, that third quality is, is commitment, dedication, and an interest, a real keen interest in what that, um, that law firm does. So as Shannon touched on before, uh, if we're looking for a, you know, a, a maritime candidate or, or whatever. We, we don't just do maritime law. We do commodities. We do international arbitration. We do lots of different um, areas of law. But what, I, what I'm what i looking for, and, and again, this came through with Shannon. I hope she doesn't mind me saying so, but um, came through in, in her master's and, and going to Southampton and, and that real interest in maritime demonstrated to me that she's committed to wanting to work for that firm. And so if you're if, if you're interested in, um, in a particular area of law, and you won't know this now, this will, this will happen as you get into, um, into your law studies at university, that you start to focus on a particular area, then try and line up work experiences with firms that you can learn more about that industry. So if you're you know, wanting to do property, try and get, get in with a law firm that does a lot of property transactions, learn more about the industry. Um, that that law firm seeks to serve. And if you add those other things to your application process, and you can start to do it now, really, you can start to do it right now and think about, okay, I want to 
I want my personal statement to be full of interesting things. What can I be doing in addition to my studies over the next year to make that full to the brim? And then you, you then go on to, if you, if you do go on to legal studies and you carry that approach through into your degree as well and look to, to fill it out with other experiences. And, and that's how you demonstrate that commitment factor. And I think that's a key part of it. I think that's a really good answer, Luke. And I also, just to add, I think that um, having legal work experience is amazing and that's really great. But at your level at the moment, that might be hard to grab. And I know that when I was at college, I worked in uh, Costa Coffee for a few years. And that was something that didn't just, I didn't just learn how to make a latte. I learned how to speak with people. I learned how to communicate effectively. It, it was, it was, hello, madam, how's your day been? What would you like to drink today? But that the ability to communicate is really important. Um, so you might be thinking right now, oh, my job at Next or my job in Sainsbury's isn't helping me. This is really sad. I'm not going to be able to be a lawyer. That's not true. It's something that you can just, it, it's an extra bit. Everything you do extracurricular wise is always important, even if you think it's not. And so I think that, that those things can help demonstrate commitment and, and wanting to be a professional in any manner, I think that they're really important as well. So that, that's the thing that I would add to Luke's answer there. That's a, that is a, uh, an interesting question. Uh, I, I can't help but um, think of that question in the context of what we're, where we are right now. Um, and, the it's multi multifaceted of course of that kind of question um but i was reading only recently that um one might expect because as i mentioned before a lot of the courts for um for during this period have been operating online and um have been uh you know running trials and hearings through skype and and all the rest of it um, and so I would immediately think, you know, the first instinct would be like, oh, well, that must make it easier to, um, to deliver justice and um, to provide, uh, you know, the, the services of a court to all parts of society and for particularly unrepresented uh, litigants that not having to go to court, being able to deal with it online would be a... Um, an easier process however some of the reports that I, i've been reading um go the other direction and that actually for unrepresented litigants that it's uh, trying to work the technology out is another complication or another you know, difficulty in this process now that might just be a short-term issue uh, as we all get more used to using video conferencing services and the rest of it but I thought it's it, it's an inter it's an interesting angle because while this seems like only a small part of answering your question, um, the way that justice is being delivered is going to change. I think after this, you, you are going to see more technology in courts, and longer term, I'd I'd like to think that that might assist um access to justice um it, it's going to require um the guidance uh, from from the courts and others uh, to help the unrepresented litigants um, but there should be some some advantages to that um, perhaps breaking down some of the barriers but again technology can create barriers in, in some parts of uh, the country as well i think um there's a book that you might quite like to read um, you've probably heard of it, but it's by The Secret Barrister and it's called The Stories of the Law and How It's Broken. And he is an anonymous barrister in the lead criminal law profession and he discusses all of these things in this book. And it, it's brilliant. It's a real page turner. And if it's something that you're interested in learning about, it's a really good place to start, I think. So I'd recommend that highly. And he's got a new book coming out this September, guys. So you've got two books on your on your reading list. You can, uh, you yeah, can read it. Looking forward to that one. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll I, have to put it on my list as well then, by the sounds of it. <laughs> I think that might be a good time to end. Um, most of the questions we have have been 
um, sort of answered anyway, most of them. Um, but I was thinking that might be a good time to basically for all of us to basically say thank you um, to uh, Luke and Shannon, uh, who would obviously be busy doing something else. I presume they're not billing us um, in six minute uh, intervals like they normally would be. Um, so we're very lucky to be, um, to, you know, be graced with your, you know, with your insights and things like that. Um, so to the students, thank you very much for um, attending. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you all as well from us. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, an uncertain time, but uh, I, I genuinely believe that we're going to um, get through this stronger on the other side. And um, don't let any of what's happening at the moment um, worry you long term. Think, things will, will play out and find a way uh, through. Um, I'd encourage you to, um, to, to try and um, try and line up some experiences. We are, um, as a firm, we are um, developing a, a kind of uh, work experience, a virtual work experience for the summer. Uh, so if you've got some interest in that, write to Shannon. I think we're going to set a little, um, little project first uh, where you can um, describe you know, your interest in, in a career in law. And from that, we'll be selecting, um, uh, selecting some candidates for a virtual uh, work placement with us. Um, and as Shannon also mentioned, if, if you want, if you want a second pair of eyes on your, um, personal development statements, we'd be happy to, to help out there as well. So look, we just wanted to, um, to let you know that there are, uh, firms out there that want to see you succeed. Um, really. And I, I mean that, um, quite genuinely. So all the best. Um, and thanks again for, for jumping on today.